Honourable Member Sue Moroni. Thank you, Mr. Jenna Speaker. Queen. Thank you. Mr Speaker, um, I intend to make a reasonably short contribution on the review of standing orders, which would reflect my relatively short period of time on the Standing Orders Committee. I came in um, partway through this process onto this committee and therefore um, missed many of the submissions, which um, I felt was a great shame because certainly there were some very important contributions that had been made. But, Mr Speaker, before I um, talk in, in substance to the review, um, I would just like to make a couple of acknowledgements. Uh, first of all, Mr Speaker, to you um, for your fine valedictory speech uh, yesterday and um, all the best for your future and the next journey that you are about to take uh, in your life. Um, can I also acknowledge Faye Patterson, who is um, in the, the chair, uh, the, uh, the clerk's chair um, at present, uh, and congratulate her on her 25 years um, in this parliament and uh, congratulate her on her final day uh, in the sitting of this parliament and wish um, her well for her next adventure in her life as well. Thank you, Faye. And, yeah, well, my, my learned colleague, um, Trevor... Oh, he's not learned. My honourable colleague, or my honourable colleague, um, Trevor Mallard, Mallard, says that she hasn't changed a bit and um, she would probably be alone in that observation in this chamber. But, Mr Speaker, I do want to reflect on a couple of the... Um, of the standing orders provisions, because I think for uh, certainly for, for me, um, when I came into this place, uh, being quite a stranger to parliamentary process, I can uh, well understand um, people who may be listening to this debate wondering what on earth the importance of standing orders are. But they do um, not only guide what occurs in this place, uh, but they, they also have a very practical application and I want to use a couple of examples of some of the things that came before the committee for discuss, discussion with this report to give some examples of a piece of legislation that I've been intimately involved in and how the, how the review applies to that because Mr Speaker one of the issues that was raised by submitters that the committee couldn't find a way forward on. Um, as, as many other members have already said, this is a committee that acts on consensus. Uh, therefore, by definition, the, uh, the standing orders review, uh, the recommendations are often pretty conservative on that basis because it does require the agreement of all the parties sitting around the table before we can make progress. Nonetheless, we have made some progress um, and, and it's incremental pro progress that will continue in future parliaments. The issue that came before the, uh, the committee that um, I had a uh, uh, close and uh, personal brush with was the issue of financial veto. There were submissions from members of the public uh, around the idea that if a bill has the majority support in Parliament, should a government be able to put a financial veto on such a bill? And, um, well, it was an issue that, that, was, that was raised. Pardon? Well, that's, ex that's exactly the debate that I'm just about to raise, actually, Ms. Mrs Upston. Um, the, the members opposite are very, very nervous about the discussion of financial veto, and, and I understand that. I, I get that. But um, what, so, so what submitters said was that they, they had an issue to raise around democracy and how that, how that actually played out. Some submitters, I understand it, raised the prospect of, because the, the bill, of course, was the, the bill to extend paid parental leave to 26 weeks. And, um, and people said, well, look, actually what you've got is, yes, you do have a government that has a mandate to... Uh, run the books and to make decisions on what the finances are, are spent on. But on this occasion, two of the, oh, sorry, one of the votes in favour of the bill was also um, a, a person who, or a party that was voting to give the government supply and confidence. A party that actually gave the mandate to the government of the day to make decisions about the priorities in which it spent its budget. So that was a really interesting dilemma, a very interesting dilemma I think that that bill posed because here, who, here were um, some of the votes that actually gave the government the right to set their, their budget, um, actually voting for um, some of that money to be spent on a measure that the government opposed. 
And, and I think that that, um, that caused a really interesting dilemma that I don't know that this Parliament has ever seen before. Well, Mrs Tully says, oh, rubbish, but I'm not sure that there has been a situation where a vote that's actually um, been used in the main for supplying confidence has been voted, has, has been used to vote for another measure that a financial veto was going to be used on. And so it was a very interesting issue. And, um, and I think that uh, during the course of this debate, um, we've been trying to focus on issues of democracy and issues of how we improve democracy and issues of how we continue on in the, in the future. And it's been, um, it hasn't been a controversial debate, um, but I noticed that the minute that, that we discuss the issue about financial veto, that the government benches um, become quite hostile to the idea of us actually having something to say and debating this in this context. However, it's right and it's proper. It was raised um, through the Select Committee and it was an issue that the, the committee gave some consideration to. And where we landed, I think, is also right and proper. Where we landed was that it is the right of a government to make determinations in this, in this area, um, and that governments should use that um, infrequently. In fact, it says that the use of this procedure has, in fact, been relatively restrained. And I think that probably is, in fact, correct. But it was also correct for the, for the committee to consider that issue and wonder whether, it was, uh, whether we had that um, in exactly the right place. We did come to the conclusion that it is for now. But I think it's something that, as, uh, as MMP continues to test the uh, processes of this parliament, that we will continue to think about. The other issue that had a direct, uh, direct bearing on uh, the procedure of that bill through this House was the, the new and now codified through this review of standing orders that we're debating here today, uh, the, the new provision for a Speaker to grant compassionate leave. Now that was a relatively new uh, policy that was brought in and it's now been codified under this review of standing orders. And, and I welcome that because I think it has worked well. And one of the times that we got to test that uh, literally on its feet, was during the second reading of the bill to extend paid parental leave to 26 weeks. When uh, we, of course, have a bill that, uh, that was passing through its second reading by one vote, and every, one of the, every single one of those votes was, was important. But because of the standing orders in, in this parliament, Mr Speaker, we uh, had a situation where the, one of the parties that was supporting the bill had, um, uh, had a member of its caucus leave the precinct, and therefore, that therefore meant that they couldn't vote legitimately at their full strength. And uh, how ironic was it that we were debating extending paid parental leave to 26 weeks, um, and the reason why the Member of Parliament had legitimately needed to leave the parliamentary precinct was to attend the birth of, uh, of his first grand grandchild. It was um, the sort of irony that uh, happens actually quite regularly in this parliamentary uh, debating chamber that, uh, that makes it a very, very interesting place to be operating in. And so, of course, um, what we tested on the floor of the, of the debating chamber right there and then was the ability of the Speaker to grant compassionate leave on those grounds. It was, it was uh, something that hadn't been tested before, was tested that night, and I'm pleased to report that it was, it was tested successfully, that compassionate leave was granted by the Speaker, and, um, and that member's vote was therefore um, able to be counted in the vote. Um, how, it, how, it got the, <laughs> how, how it got cast is a different matter entirely, and I won't go into that because the members opposite are already getting tetchy enough at the mere, the mere uh, mention of the paid parental leave bill, because it does always cause them um, quite a bit of angst. But, Mr Speaker, um, in conclusion, I hope that people listening can see the practical application of the issues that were debated by the Standing Orders Committee. I hope that they will be able to see how it makes a real difference to the way the debating chamber operates and how laws are made in, in this country for the good of its people. There are areas where um, we can always make more progress, but 
there is a start, and, uh, and as we always do in each parliament, uh, continue to refine and improve the processes. Thank you. Right. The question is that the government notice of motion number two be agreed to. Those of that opinion will please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is that the government notice of motion number three be agreed to. Those of that opinion will please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Honourable members, having dealt with the government notice of motion, I therefore call on government order of the day number nine. Crimes match fixing amendment bill first reading. I recognise the Honourable Minister, Judith Collins.